<laughs> hey, everybody, and welcome back to For the Booze. For the Booze. For the Booze. This is the second to last before Halloween season is complete. Yeah. And, and I, look. Haunt. I have spooky objects. Yeah, I've I've enjoyed doing them, but I'm looking forward to getting back to what we do with the locations. And we already have a suggestion, uh, a listener suggestion, I guess. If I don't know if she yes. listens, but I know I'm super excited. I am super excited to get back on some locations. Absolutely, and <laughs> they're exciting, my favorite. Exciting because for the last one, you'll actually be home to record it, so that will be nice. I know. I know this will be the last one for now on the road, but I will be back for the next one. You might be back and for the one after that. Yeah, actually, I think I might. This, Maybe. Will, this will be the last one. Maybe. The last weird one. Possibly. It's like 50 50. We'll have to look into it. Uh, yeah, right. But, you know, we went into this and I wanted to do, I wanted to do as many as I could. So this week we're actually going to do two episodes. We're going to, not two episodes, but we're going to do two subjects within this one episode yeah and we are going to we're going over to europe for this one because all the haunted objects can't just be you know here yeah and for sure there's some pretty famous ones you know across the pond and it's it's hard in a in today's market to like there's a lot of items that are claimed to be haunted you know especially like google uh like haunted dolls and tell oh me, gosh. tell me how many eBay listings you can find for haunted dolls. There's so many. You will be there for so long. It's ridiculous. I mean, and it's <laughs> like everything, everything from the creepiest looking thing to like something you could go to Walmart and buy right now. Yep. Oh you yeah. Know, just ridiculous. It's, crazy. It, it's ridiculous. It's as bad. It's worse than Divic boxes, honestly. But uh, I, yeah. So the way we're going to do this is for the first half of the show, I'm going to have a story to tell you. And for the second half of the show, you're going to have a story to tell me. Yay. I also want to welcome a whole bunch of new listeners that came out of nowhere. Yes. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, new Booze Crew yeah. friends. I mean, the Booze Crew just like doubled in size over this week, and I'm here for it. Don't get me wrong. I am here for it. 100%. So, Welcome everybody who is new. We we hope you keep listening and enjoy the show as much as we like giving them to you. Hey, they just knew that this week was my birthday week. Yeah, actually, today is your birthday. So happy birthday. Yes, the day we are recording right now, today, Friday, yes. is my birthday. October 20th, 1986. Oh, no. Ah. <laughs> That's right. Turn 37. Still as beautiful as the day I met you. Thanks, baby. You're welcome. But yeah, so we actually, what, what a first, right, in the show. An episode comes out on my birthday, and then we record one on yours. I know. That's, That's crazy. That's weird. But <laughs> let's, let's get into this, okay? Uh, the first episode that we are doing within this show is we are going to talk about something I am positive you have never heard of. Uh -oh. And it is okay. called the Bosano Vase. Oh. This is so interesting. This is so mysterious. You would not be able to go look at it today. Really? Really. And it starts a story in Italy. Oh. Gonna go over. Over that away, huh? To Italy, to beautiful Italy. <laughs> I bet it is beautiful. I've never been there, so I know. I, no I definitely want to go, but yeah, but, I want to go all over, over, over the pond, across the pond, across the you, pond, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, you know, because you got family there, and I've got some. I do. You know, I've got a friend there. I would really like to go visit, but I know. So, what do you say we get into part one of this show? All right, tell me a story, babe. Here we go. The history of Naples is long and varied, dating to Greek settlements established in the Naples area in the second millennium BC. 
During the end of the Greek Dark Ages, a larger mainland colony, initially known as Parthenope, developed on Pizzo Falcone Hill in the 8th century BC and was refounded as Nepalese in the 6th century BC. It held an important role in Magna Graecia. The Greek culture of Naples was important to later Roman society. When the city became part of the Roman Republic in the central province of the empire, it was a major cultural center. It served as the capital of the Duchy of Naples, 661 to 1139, of the Kingdom of Sicily, of the Kingdom of Naples, 1282 to 1816, and finally, of the two Sicilies until the unification of Italy in 1861. The city has seen the rise and fall of several civilizations and cultures, each which has left traces in its art and architecture. And during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment era, it was a major center of culture. It was also a capital of Baroque, beginning with the artist Caravaggio's career in the 17th century and the artistic revolution he inspired. During the Neapolitan War, the city rebelled against the Bourbon monarchs, spurring the early push towards Italian unification. Today, Naples is part of the Italian Republic, the third largest municipality or central area by population after Rome and Milan, and has the second or third largest metropolitan area of Italy. The Naples area has been inhabited since the Stone Age. In the second millennium BC, a first Mycenaean settlement arose not far from the geographical position of the future city of Parthenope. Parthenope was founded by Cumae, the earliest Greek city on mainland Italy, at the end of the 8th century BC. Parthenope was named after the siren in Greek mythology, said to have washed ashore in Megaride, having thrown herself into the sea after she failed to bewitch Ulysses with her song. The settlement was built on the Pizzo Falcone promontory, allowing control of sea traffic in the area. Little archaeology for Parthenope has come to light, but a necropolis of the 7th century BC was discovered in Via Nectora. A ceramics waste dump dated to the Archaic Age was discovered in Via Chaya Timon, where it had slid from the hill of Pizzo Falcone. When the colony began to be more frequented due to the abundance and amenity of the places, the Cumaeans worried that their city would be abandoned and decided to destroy it. Nepalese, or New City, was founded by the Cumaean aristocracy, expelled by the tyrant Aristodemus after the victory of Aresia in 507 BC. The oligarchs decided to establish Nepalese as a, quote, second Kume, similar to the city from which they came. For example, the continuation of cults such as that of Demeter and the faithful resumption of the organization in Phrenius confirm this. The chronology is confirmed by archaeological finds, the original center of Parthenope on the Pizzo Falcone Hill was simply called Palaepolis, the old city, and survived as a second peripheral pole of Nepalese. The new city complex was designed on a rectangular grid of streets. It was built on a plateau sloping from north to south, which allowed space for a new city. Swamps made routes to the hinterland difficult and prevented its possession of extensive agricultural lands that most of Campania benefited from and made Nepalese focus on the sea and trade for its livelihood. The city eventually became one of the foremost cities of Magna Graecia and long retained its Greek culture even after defeat by the Romans. Later, in 1442, Alfonso I 
conquered Naples after his victory against the last Angevin king, René, and made his triumphal entry into the city in February 1443. The new dynasty enhanced commerce by connecting Naples to the Iberian Peninsula and made Naples a center of the Italian Renaissance. Artists who worked in Naples in this period include Francesco Lorana, Antonello de Messina, Giacopo Senzaro, and Angelo Polizzino. The court also granted land holdings in the provinces to the nobility. This, however, had the effect of fragmenting the kingdom. Now, the Bassano vase is a curiously strange tale. Surrounded by death, the vase was considered cursed by those who possessed it, but seemingly cursed without explanation. In fact, no one really understands how or why it became so powerful or where the curse originated from. Also, unlike other haunted or cursed objects, the Bassano vase isn't available for scrutiny. In fact, its whereabouts are unknown. There are no direct eyewitness accounts of the problematic vase, only stories of its deadly power. From what is commonly known, the vase was a simple silver design, weighing approximately four pounds and was crafted sometime during the 15th century as a wedding gift. It's been listed on multiple websites as one of the most haunted objects known to mankind but the lack of details on the origin of the vase continues to perplex even the most diligent students of the paranormal. The earliest account of the vase dates back to the 15th century in a small town north of Nepali. The legend says that the vase was given to a young bride on the night before her wedding, perhaps as a gift of good fortune, or perhaps something more sinister. Unfortunately, the young woman never made it to her own wedding, she was discovered dead the next morning. Some say it was murder, while others have no explanation. It's likely that the latter has more credibility since there are no records of a murder investigation. The murder angle isn't always part of the story, but it will be examined as we review the stories. Little information has survived about the bride-to-be or her suitor, including their names. Soon after the young woman was laid to rest, the Bassano vase was given to another family member, who sadly also died shortly after receiving it. It was once again passed to another family member, with the same unfortunate ending, another quick death almost immediately after taking possession of the vase. The family soon came to the understanding that the vase was cursed and connected to death somehow, so they had it hidden away. There are several claims on how it was hidden away. Some say it was buried, while others speak of it being hidden by a priest, presumably in a church or other holy resting place. The vase would not stay hidden forever, and in 1988, it was unearthed once more. Examining the vase, a piece of paper was hidden inside, reading, quote, Beware, this vase brings death. A warning which was promptly discarded as ancient curses are nothing compared to the sweet, sweet thrill of the auction house. Selling for 4 million lira, today equivalent to $143,015.48 in American money, the vase once again re-entered circulation and with it came deaths. Supposedly, the first buyer, a pharmacist, owned the vase for three months before dying in mysterious circumstances. Then came the 37-year-old surgeon, who died two months later. The vase was resold once more, this time to an archaeologist who coveted the vase as a beautiful example of high Renaissance work. But after three months with the vase in his collection, 
the man was dead. By this point, the vase had garnered somewhat of an unsavory reputation, and try as they might, the family could not resell the vase for anywhere near the same amount the archaeologist had paid. However, despite the loss, once again the vase was sold and the new owner duly perished. Rumors of the curse were now well circulated, and the vase was utterly unsellable. Enraged and taking the fate of the vase into their own hands, a family member hurled the silver vessel out of the window. Supposedly, this killer throw cracked a passing police officer on the head, but for once was not fatal. Instead, the officer tried to return the vase and issue him with a ticket for disorderly behavior. Now, the ticket was taken without question, but they refused to take back the vase. Having been lumbered with the vase, the police tried to pass the item to local museums, but the legend of the curse put them off every time. Now, one way to look at this is that the belief in the curse was so intense that it was even greater than any beliefs in other curses, such as items stolen from Egyptian tombs. Instead, the vase never made it to a museum, but remained in police custody. Several rumors circulated as to its final fate. Many believe it was buried once more, while others arguing it was hidden in cemetery grounds, so that no one would dig it up again. In short, we just don't know. There are no concrete accounts of anyone being in contact with the vase. No personal experiences, only stories and rough guesses as to its whereabouts. Looking at the legend with a skeptical eye, we find that there are no names for any of the characters in the story. Even the vase was said to have reappeared in 1988, and no one has a name. The man who found it, those who died, or the cop. Locations are nameless as well. Where it was found in Italy is not named along with the auction house and the cemetery. Yet, with all these missing details, the Bassano vase is listed on many websites and magazines as one of the most cursed objects in the world. Now, looking at the legend itself raises a bunch of questions as well. The first is a silver object carrying a curse. Silver was often used to ward off evil and was even a healing metal throughout history. It would be unlikely that many in the 15th century would consider an item coated in silver as a cursed object. Then, in the 20th century, the police officer attempts to give the vase to a museum before burying it. Considering how many supposedly cursed objects sit in various museums today, such as from King Tut's tomb and Thomas Busby's chair. It seems highly unlikely a museum would refuse to house a 15th century antique vase. In the end, the only thing we do have is a grainy picture of the vase that may or may not actually be the Bassano vase, or a vase from the 15th century. So there's never any solid proof that this existed at all. Um, hmm. Just a good story, you know? It's very, very intriguing, though, I feel. Like, a lot of things that we've talked about come with curses attached to them or things like that. And I feel like in that point in history that, like Italy and Europe and mm. things like that were a lot different in their belief system. I guess, yeah, like their beliefs and how legends could hold such a truth. So yeah, I think it's that old school Euro European thing where they were, you know, a little less cynical than people are now and probably put a lot more into the belief of curses and haunted objects. Um Yeah. For me, now I did Google most haunted objects because, I mean, this is what we're doing for Halloween. Right. And this thing is on every list. It doesn't Ooh. It doesn't miss a list. And it's up there as, like, one of the top most haunted objects of all time, yet nobody knows where it is. 
Well, it says, you said, like, the most haunted object of mankind. Well, like, I mean, yeah, that's a claim, but, I mean, it's, yeah. supposedly, it's killed a lot of people, but there's, I mean, there's not, like, there's no picture of somebody holding it, or, there's, like, there's no proof of this thing actually existing other than a picture that people say, this is it, and right. nobody really knows for sure if that's it. Hmm. So, I mean. Very, very, very interesting. You know, in 1988, we had cameras. Yeah. And what and 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 a good point in there was, with all the haunted and cursed objects we have nowadays, supposedly, that are in museums. Why not this one? Why would they not take this one? Why Why would this one not be the one? It's a good question. Yeah, because they take everything. Yeah, everything. The I mean, the worst stuff in the world people want, hmm. but this one they just wouldn't do. So yeah. we we get to do something twice today. And that thing is. Oh. Is it real? So, Megan, when it comes to the Bassano vase, this Italian piece of Renaissance artwork that we cannot see at all. I mean, it's a good story. I mean, it comes with like some murder, <laughs> like some murder and, you know, stuff like that. But do you think that there's any validity to the story at all? Uh, okay. So I think there is validity, not to the vase itself, but I think like the, the string of things that happened around the vase. So I don't think it's the vase itself. I think that, that like the legends and stuff, why people died. I mean, it was a really, really, really long time ago. Like we're talking about like the 1500s here. 1400s. Okay, well, even better that I, I mean, people just dropped like flies back then. And I mean, yes, there was doctors and things like that. But I mean, even doctors in like the freaking 40s and 50s and 60s, like aren't like doctors are today. So I don't I don't know. I think you are really taking the long way around on this one. <laughs> I, I am. I am. But I. I don't know. I think like the legends around it. Yes, I could definitely see that being a thing. But for the base itself, no, I don't. So no, is that what? You're so no. <laughs> <laughs> for any new listeners to the show, this is a typical answer. <laughs> yeah. If yes, you, it is. If you came very here, very long-winded answer. If you came here to, for decided facts, I'm sorry. <laughs> Happy Halloween. Well, anyways, what about you, babe? I think it's all fake. And I just think it's a good story. There's right. no proof of any any one of these characters in this story. Not one. Okay. Okay? Yeah. The whole thing is based, it starts with a, a bride-to-be on her wedding night receiving this. And there's other variations of this story that say that uh, maybe her spirit, she curses it, right? Hmm. But the fact that there is not one name, not one picture, you can't see it. Nobody knows if the one picture that exists is actually even of it. And it was unearthed in a time of Ed and Lorraine Warren at like the height of their popularity. And the, no museum in the world would take it. I am sorry. I think yeah. it's fake. Well, that's, that's, that's fair. That Thumbs, down. fair. Thumbs down. Thumbs <laughs> down. As a matter of fact... Do not recommend. <laughs> of all the haunted objects we've talked about, I think I would be, I think I would be more cautious of a Divic box than I would be the Bazano vase. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And you know how I feel about Divic boxes. Yes, we know how we feel about this. So, cuz I am right there with you. But it's a cool, you know what the the story kind of in a way reminds me of the girl who got her head cut off at Bobby Mackey's, you know, like the whole legend thing. Yeah. You know, where yeah. it, but the, the thing about that was that happened. It just didn't happen where people say it happened. Right. You know, because people claim that's why it's so haunted, but the girl got her head cut off like 10 miles away, but it's still, it's like this legend that has just been conjured up to the thing that throws me off though. Is why does this thing make so many lists with so many skeptical people in the world? Right. No, absolutely. I agree because 
I, maybe it just sounds like a good thing to throw on a list that maybe people don't go on and kind of research and do the kind of things that we do. I don't know. Maybe, but for me, it's a hard pass on that one. Um, but hey, we're we're gonna get one eventually that we think is real. I mean, that's we are kind of we are. It does happen, I promise, of every once in a while. But <laughs> I, I think maybe we'll get a little closer to one in the near future, uh, like possibly after these ads. And now, Boost Crew, back to part two of this show. <laughs> If you visit the small jewel of a museum in Thirsk, you will see the rather strange sight of an oak chair hung from the ceiling in one of the display areas. The chair was suspended at the explicit request of its owner to prevent anyone from ever sitting on it, including maintenance and cleaners. The museum has never broken its promise in over 30 years, despite numerous requests and even the threat of legal action. Local legend has it that the chair belonged to Thomas Busby, a thug, thief, and drunkard who lived in North Yorkshire in the latter part of the 1600s. Busby married Elizabeth, the daughter of a small-time petty crook, Daniel Awady, who lived near the village of Kirby Whisk. Awady had purchased a farm after moving to the area from Leeds. His house, which he called Danity Hall, was idea for Awady, enabling him to continue with his illegal coining activities in relative seclusion. It was even reported that Awadi had built within the house a hidden chamber which was connected to the cellar via a secret passageway. Busby, who was also the original owner of an inn near Sand Hutton and just three miles away from Danity Hall, became Awadi's partner in crime. The details of what happened that fatal last day of Awadi's life are vague. Awadi and Busby may have argued earlier that day, but over what is not known. It could have been something to do with Elizabeth, the coining business, or almost anything else. Their relationship was known to be far from harmonious with Busby often in a foul mood, with Awadi for some reason or another. What is clear is later that day, a drunken and volatile Busby returned to his inn only to find Awadi waiting for him, threatening to take Elizabeth home with him. Busby's mood only blackened when he saw Awadi sitting in his favorite chair. Whatever their second argument of the day was over, Busby forcibly removed Awadi from the chair and threw him out. That night, Busby, still seething, grabbed a hammer, stormed over to Danity Hall, and bludgeoned Awadi to death. Busby then tried to hide his handiwork in the woods. Concern over Awadi's sudden disappearance led to a local search of the area being made. On finding the body, Busby was arrested at the inn and charged with the murder. In the summer of 1702, Busby was tried and sentenced to death for murder 
at the York Assizes. His punishment was to be gibbeted, i.e. hung from a gibbet. His body dipped in tar and his remains displayed on a stoop attached to the gibbet in full view of his inn. The inn was soon after renamed the Busby Stoop Inn, a name which it retained until it closed in 2012. It is here that the story veers away from historical and moves into the realms of local folklore. One version recounts how Busby was granted his last wish, which was to have a final drink at his own inn and sit in his favorite chair. On leaving the inn to make his final journey to the execution site, Busby cursed the chair, declaring that death would come shortly to anyone who sat in it. Another version tells how Busby drunkenly shouted out the curse whilst being taken to the gibbet to be hung. Whichever way you look at it, Busby was determined that even from beyond the grave, he would never allow anyone to enjoy sitting in his beloved chair. Busby's spirit was believed to have haunted his old pub as well as the area where he was gibbeted. But it's his precious chair, the focus of his curse, which became irrevocably linked to his revengeful spirit. According to local legend, this seemingly innocuous piece of furniture has been responsible for more deaths than most serial killers. One estimate even puts the number of its victims at over 60. The first reported death alleged to be associated with the death chair is that of a chimney sweep who along with a friend sat in the chair whilst having a drink one evening in 1894. The sweep never made it home that night and being completely inebriated he laid down on the road to sleep. The next morning his body was found hanging from the post next to the gibbet. His death was ruled as a suicide, but in 1914, the friend with whom the chimney sweep had spent his last hours with admitted on his deathbed to having robbed and murdered his friend. During the Second World War, the pub became a popular drinking spot with RCAF airmen. The airmen would dare each other to sit in the chair. Those that took up the challenge never returned from their missions. In 1968, a couple of years before Tony Earnshaw took over the running of the pub, he overheard two airmen dare each other to sit in the chair. They both did. Returning to the airfield, their car left the road and crashed into a tree. They both died on the way to the hospital. Through the early 1970s, the chair seemed to claim a number of victims, including a cleaning lady who was diagnosed with a brain tumor after knocking into the chair. A number of cyclists and motorcyclists who suffered fatal road accidents. A hitchhiker who was run over after having spent two nights at the pub. And a local man who died of a heart attack shortly after sitting in the condemned chair. A group of builders having a drink at the pub convinced the youngest of their group to sit in the chair. Back at the site, the man fell through the roof of a building and landed on the concrete ground below. His death 
proved to be the final straw for Earnshaw, and he banished the chair to the cellar. A delivery man from the brewery was in the cellar one day when he decided to try out the chair. He commented to Earnshaw that it was far too comfortable to be left down there. He was killed shortly afterwards when his van went off the road. Soon after, Earnshaw must have decided that the chair, despite being a profitable tourist attraction, was too dangerous to keep any longer. In 1978, Earnshaw donated it to the Thirsk Museum. The debate between the supernatural and the natural is long-standing, and the Busby Stoop Chair case is no exception. The question arises, is the chair truly cursed, or are the associated incidents merely coincidences? On one hand, there is the argument that most, if not all, accidents linked to the chair can be explained through natural causes. Many of the victims were in situations where accidents were likely to occur, such as being involved in risky behaviors or dangerous occupations. For example, during World War II, the mortality rate for airmen was high, and it could be argued that their deaths were more related to the hazards of war than to a curse. On the other hand, the sheer number of accidents and the specific circumstances surrounding them could also be linked to a deadly curse, as the frequency and nature of these incidents go beyond mere coincidence. Not to mention that many visitors to the Thirsk Museum, where the chair is now housed, have reported various paranormal experiences in the object's close proximity. Some claim to have felt a sense of unease or dread when near the chair. Others have reported a cold chill, a common phenomenon in haunted locations. There are also accounts of visitors seeing the ghost of Thomas Busby near the chair. These sightings often describe a figure resembling Busby's description, appearing to guard the chair or even sitting in it. While these experiences are subjective and cannot be significantly proven, they add to the lore surrounding the chair and its alleged curse. Historian Dr. Adam Bowett is a renowned figure in the field of furniture history, with a particular focus on English furniture made between 1660 and 1840. His expertise in the subject has led him to author several books and articles, making him a respected authority in his field. In his quest to unravel the mysteries of the Busby Stoop Chair, Dr. Bowett concluded a thorough examination of the allegedly haunted and cursed object. This examination occurred in the early 2000s when the chair was already a well-known artifact in the Thirsk Museum. Dr. Bowett's work was meticulous involving a visual inspection and a detailed study of the chair's construction and materials. He used different techniques, including dendrochronology, a method that involves analyzing tree ring growth patterns in the wood to determine its age. His findings were intriguing. The chair's construction and the type of wood used were consistent with furniture-making practices of the late 17th century, around the time Thomas Busby would have been alive. However, 
The spindles of the chair, he advised, were machine-made, a process not developed until much later in history. He concluded this chair was made around 1840, 138 years after Busby was executed. However, Dr. Bowett was careful to point out that while the chair's age could be confirmed, the tales of its curse were harder to substantiate. In his final conclusions, Dr. Bowett stated that while the chair's history and the stories surrounding it were fascinating, whether or not it was truly cursed was a matter of personal belief. Today, the Busby Stoop Chair is housed in the Thirsk Museum, where it continues to draw the attention and spark curiosity. However, given the chair's deadly reputation, the decision was made to hang the chair from the ceiling. This was done not only to preserve the chair as a historical artifact, but also to prevent anyone from sitting on it and potentially becoming the next victim of Busby's curse. So Thomas Busby's chair is, in a professional opinion of, uh, which, by the way, is I've never heard of a historical furniture professional. I'm sure they exist. I mean, I, I know people that, like, you know, like, study that kind of thing, but sure. I definitely didn't um, know about the dendrochronology part of it. <laughs> <laughs> dendrochronology. Yeah. Now, like I, what? I read very conflicting stories. I, I read some that said he confirmed that that, it, that the chair's age was correct. But I found a few more than the latter that it wasn't, that he found it to be in, you know, not right. So right. I put the one that had the most, which was that he said it didn't. But there's really like a... Like a conflicting thing. The, yeah, like it could right. be real, it couldn't. But... Regardless of, you know, the fact that it could or may not be, this is still the chair that people claim that when people sat in it, they died. Right. So. Yeah. And, and I, I, the whole time I was reading, I kept thinking like, there isn't really any folklore legend or anything behind this. Maybe that's just. I had the way it's been written and like what the you, way you what, found things. What but do you, what do you mean? But you know, like when you were reading yours, like it came out that, Oh, legend has it or yeah. Legend has it know, that Thomas Busby went over and killed his father-in-law and for sitting in his chair. <laughs> but like, there wasn't any of that is what I'm saying. That's the story. What do you mean? That is the story. That's the folklore. He went over, he murdered a dude that was sitting in his chair and then the day of you know him going to by the way a gibbet is a, a gallow where they hang people yeah um, i figured the day that the folklore in this is the day that he went to the gibbet they supposedly said that they let him have one last drink in his favorite chair and he stood up from the chair and said i curse anyone who ever sits in this chair to death Okay, I get that, but I'm just saying it's not dredged over like it has been in a lot of things. This is all I'm saying. I'm okay. I'm confused, but all right. The, there is a story here, and it is a fascinating story because we talk about a lot of locations that are uh, binded people's souls to the, to a location because of their love of of a place, and we've also mentioned that this could be the case in an item. Now. I'm a I'm a dude and I'm a I'm a, like a I'm a, a biological man who is from the Gen X generation and I know the importance of my chair. <laughs> and if I was going to die, I this would This is very true everyone, I would, so you know. <laughs> I would curse anyone who sat in my chair to death. <laughs> and I would try to see that through. <laughs> This is an incredibly true statement right. from this guy right here. Do not touch my chair, nor may you touch my remote control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But I think this is, I, I love this story, if I'm being honest. And this is something that you can go see. This is something that does exist and is hanging up somewhere and you can go see it. Mm-hmm. But we have to ask you one more time without the folklore, I guess. Is it real? Do you think there is anything to the story of Thomas Busby's chair? I'm going to say yes. I I kind of vibed with this one a little bit. I okay, the folklore whatever. Um but I could definitely see this being a thing. Now did someone touch the furniture afterwards and have to replace the spindles before this doctor of furniturology <laughs> came and looked at it? I don't know, probably, maybe. But I don't know. I'm going to have to say yes for this one. Okay. What about you? I am I'm actually going to say yes as well. Oh, but. okay. I'm going to say yes for a different reason. I'm not sure that I believe that the chair is cursed and if you sit in it, you die. I believe this is more... I, I, I actually subscribe to the fact that the people, every person who was said to sit in this, and there are some of these that are confirmed, mm-hmm. uh, they did. They worked very high-risk occupations, um, so the chances of them dying, especially during that time period, were much higher. Yeah. So I think it's just all a coincidence, a, a, a very strange coincidence, but a coincidence nonetheless. But I think that because of the things we've talked about in the past about how people get emotionally binded to these places and things, that even if it's not Thomas Busby, I believe there's something binded to this chair because aside from all the deaths that have happened from people who have interacted with the chair, people have claimed to see a figure with this chair. Right. Which there's actual like factual claims. People have people have made claims at the museum and stuff. So for me, yeah. I'm gonna say yes, but not necessarily in line with the story that you read. But, okay. But for my own reasons. So That's we fair. finally Actually, got one. I like that. I like that uh, version of that. <laughs> so uh... <laughs> well, we finally got one, which means that after so <gasps> long, we get. A big old seal of approval. And yeah, finally. Yay! I'm going to tell everybody right now, though. You have to come back for the conclusion of Halloween season. Because we're going to tell one that everybody knows and everybody's afraid of. I am so flippin' excited for this Uh, one. I am so excited. uh, One that exists. You can see it. But you can't, nor would you even want to get close to it. So that's it for this week. And this was a rough one for us, honestly. This was a hard yeah. one. <laughs> that's okay. You, nobody, yeah. nobody will know because of the power of editing. That's uh, right. We can, both struggled uh, very hard. hard. You know, but <laughs> reading. If you're a today. listener, if, if you're a listener too, you got to understand like how much it throws us off to be doing this over the computer and. It's just, it makes everything harder, but we're here, but we're here. We're we're putting it out for you guys. So where can they find us? We are. They can find us on Instagram at for the booze underscore podcast and on Facebook at for the booze. You can also find us on uh, Twitter at for the booze and also on the tube of you uh, at for the booze. (laughs) You look it up. It'll be there. Also, if you have a listener suggestion or a spooky story you would like to send in, please, for the love of God, for the last one at least, somebody sent a story in, for the booze 12 at gmail.com. And everybody, you know what? I don't care if it's five stars anymore. Just review the show wherever you listen. Just send it in. I'll take your hate. I don't mind. It is what it is. But let us know <laughs> from wherever you are in this tiny little rock shooting through space where you're listening from. And uh, tell us how you feel. That's it. Yeah. How you feel or just, I don't know, tell us what color your car is. Yeah. We don't care. Yeah, we don't mind. But I guess this is going to be it. What do you think? I think this wraps this one up. And thank you, everybody, so much for listening. And we will see See you in the next next one. one. Bye. Bye. One day we'll get that down pat, you know. (laughs) 